Father, we come into your presence again this morning, not just as part of the ritual of prayer, but in recognition of the great need that we have. I stand before your people, a portion of your people this morning, trying to put into words concepts which none of us can really understand. We try, we struggle, we gain a little bit, but there's always so much more. And so this morning, we prayed that you would pull the curtain back, that you would peel another layer off the onion. Whatever metaphor we use, Lord, that you would make it beneficial to us and help us to love Jesus more. In his name we pray. Amen. Several years ago, when I first was elected to the office on 63rd Street, a friend sent me a beautiful flower. It was to either congratulate me or to cheer me up. I'm not sure which. But, so you will know how little I know about flowers. I'll have to confess to you that I had to call my secretary into the office to ask her what it was. She took one look at it, smiled in delight, and exclaimed, My, what a beautiful orchid. Now, I had heard about orchids. Obviously, I didn't know what one looked like, but I knew two things about them. One, they were, it, it, it was a very precious flower, and I could tell that by looking at it. It was a very precious flower. The other thing that I'd heard somewhere at some time was that they were very expensive. And I can remember thinking, vaguely, how blessed I was to have a friend who thought enough about me to send me a precious gift like this. Several days, maybe even a week or so later, however, my beautiful flower was beginning to look strange. The blooms were beginning to shrivel up around the edges. And the plant looked for all the world like someone who had lost their best friend. What was wrong? I couldn't understand it. So I turned to the one who had identified the flower for me in the first place. I asked my secretary to come in and look at it. She took one look and she understood the problem. Have you ever had somebody look at you like with kind of, what's the matter with you? <laughs> she, I don't say she looked down her nose at me, but there was, there was that... Um, Caught you, look. You need to go to the woodshed. She said, Pastor, 
When was the last time you watered it? And I thought, oh no, you do have to water those things, don't you? I learned something that day about orchids. And all flowers, you know, some people say they have a green thumb. I have a brown one. And it's probably because I don't do what I should with flowers. I learned that you had to care for them, you had to nurture them, you had to water them. And I learned something that day about God's work. Not just the work with flowers, but with God's work in His kingdom. You know, I hear pastors sometimes talk about uh, doing God's work. I realize I can't do God's work for the simple reason that I'm not God. But I can do the work that God has assigned me to do, and that work is to nurture and to water and to promote the wellness of His people in His kingdom. And I've also learned, I also learned through that experience as I meditated on it, that God's kingdom can be positively or adversely affected by my faithfulness or lack of it to the job that God has called me to do. I also learned a few other things in my 40-some years of attempting, sometimes vainly, to minister to people. Some other things that aren't quite as obvious as you have to water the plant, and you need to water the church. But God, who is the master gardener, told me some other things along these lines that I'd like to share with you this morning. And I'd like to begin with the words of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, and verse 31. Jesus often taught in parables, and uh, he used parables so effectively that sometimes people didn't really catch the drift until a while later. Matthew 13 and verse 31, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed. Now, just let me stop here to ask you, How many of you have ever seen a mustard seed? I don't know that I ever had. I don't like mustard, so I don't spend a whole lot of time contemplating mustard seed. But according to what Jesus says here, a mustard seed is an inconsequential thing. He said, the kingdom of heaven... And I, and, and I want to emphasize that I, I think when he's talking about the kingdom of heaven, he's talking about his church on this earth. At least from my remarks this morning, that's the way I intended it. I hope he agrees with me, or that I agree with him, whatever. The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And here's... I'm talking about, which indeed is the least of all seeds. Tiny. I even looked up on the internet to to get a picture of what mustard seed looks like, and it's even kind of hard to see. 
It's the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Quite a change from the time when it is planted to the time when it is fully matured. Now, the first thing I would call your attention to is that God usually starts small. Now, I said I emphasize usually because I know someone is going to come to me and say, uh, in the beginning, Daryl, and you talked about that this morning, in the beginning, God started big, real big. I saw a young man on the street one day in Tulsa, and as he approached, I noticed he had something written, printed, actually, across his T-shirt. Now, I'm kind of weird. If you don't want me to read what's on your T-shirt, don't put it there. And so, as he was approaching, we were approaching each other, I stopped, looked at his T-shirt, and noticed that it said, I believe in the Big Bang Theory. And I thought, oh, poor deluded soul. But then as we passed each other, Something caused me to turn and look back to see what was on the back of his T-shirt. And then I thought about me and thought, oh, poor deluded soul. Because while the front said, I believe in the Big Bang Theory, the back said, God said it, and bang, there it was. <laughs> so, God Started, you'd, we'd have to say that he started big. The theologians call that, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this in, I won't even charge you for this, okay? The theologians call that creation by divine fiat. God said it. And there it was. So in answer to that age-old question, <clears throat> Sherry, you got me doing it. <laughs> In answer to that age-old question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I think I would have to respond, the chicken. It seems that everything in the beginning was created fully developed. I, I have a theory, and you know, you know what theories are. That's just what somebody believes, and maybe, maybe not true. And I don't know where I got this theory. But I believe that when Adam was created, he stood before God with a full beard. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because he was created, fully developed, and he was created with a full beard. Everything was created fully developed and was followed by a cycle of development and growth in order to sustain it. And when something stops developing and when something stops growing, what happens to it? It dies. Now you might first say, well, there's a process. You kind of go back maybe a little bit, but you don't go back very long. You die. Now, I think that God used the same principles when he planted his gospel kingdom. Not the Big Bang Theory, but the seed, the mustard seed process, which planted the seed and allowed it to develop. Jesus said, you remember, Mark 4, 28, 
For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. And check the context. He's talking about what he calls the kingdom. And he's talking about his kingdom on this earth. Not his kingdom in heaven, although you could make an argument they're the same. But he's talking about this kingdom on this earth of which we are a part. So when did he plant that first gospel seed, which would, be, which, which would become a mighty tree, so mighty that the birds of the air would lodge in its branches? When was the first seed? And also, the other question is, not just when was it planted, but when would it be planted? mature and ready for harvest, when would it burst into bloom? You know, maybe that's the wrong question. I have a habit of asking the wrong question. But God kindly gives me the right answers even to questions that I haven't asked. And maybe it's not so much a single planting as it is a series of events that would lead us finally to see someday what was there all along. You say, well, that's a lot of double talk. So let me explain. Perhaps you would say the first seed was planted way back there near the garden gate where God said to the serpent, and and I'd like you to notice something here as, as we read this. We often look at this as the first gospel promise. It's Genesis 3.15, and we look at the, 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 the theologians again. I'm not a theologian. I don't know. I don't even know any, but I, I read some of the things they say, and they, they have these fancy words for everything, and this is called the proto-euangelion which is a simple way of saying the first gospel. And you say, well, why didn't you just say so? Uh, But uh, the first gospel, they say, came in the book of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Notice that, well, some say that this promise was given to Eve. This is not a promise. This is a curse. And it was pronounced on the serpent. And it says, I will put enmity between thee, Satan, and the woman, Eve. And between thy seed and her seed. Here we go back to seeds again. We're talking about seeds again. And seeds will develop if cared for properly. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And and my point here is not to convince you how much I know about horticulture, because I have already demonstrated to you I don't didn't even know what an orchid looked like. So I'm not an authority on horticulture. But what's happening here in this curse is Satan, someday the seed of the woman is going to get you. And it doesn't, as the Apostle Paul points out, it doesn't say seeds. Right? We're all seeds here this morning. But we're not the seed in the sense that this is talking about. And like a seed that lay dormant under the soil of centuries. You know, I, I read in, in the encyclopedia uh, that uh, they, when they unearthed some of the ancient tombs and the, uh, uh, the Egyptian, uh, what do they call them, the pyramids, you know, the Egyptian mummies, that when they, when they unearthed some of these ancient tombs, that they found some seeds, because, you know, the, the Egyptians had a belief in the afterlife that's different than ours. 
But they believe that there was an afterlife, uh, especially for the, for the Pharaoh. Not sure about the common people, but for the Pharaoh. And they thought he was going to need something to eat in the afterlife. And so they planted, they, they, they buried with him, not food, per se, but seeds. Now, the, the thing is, I, I've, I've, I've not seen this, but I've been told that they, they, they unearthed these seeds. They, they, were, they were probably in jars or pots or something, and they, they dug them up when they dug up the, 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 the mummies, the, the pharaoh's mummy. I don't know where his daddy was, but uh, they uh, dug those seeds up with them. And you know what happened to the seeds? After thousands of years, they grew. And so like, like a, as, as I said, it, it is like a dormant seed under the soil of centuries, and it would begin to appear at several different places. For instance, in the uh, messages of the prophets. Now, you're still not looking at a beautiful orchid. You're seeing about a sprout coming out of the ground, sometimes difficult to understand. But it began to be a little more clearer, and you might, you might uh, say this is one of the spots where it began to be a more, little more clearer. Uh, on, on that mysterious night when a virgin was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. Ah, it's beginning to come to light. As the well-loved Christmas carol says, how silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. How God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. Or you might think that it comes to view on that night when the angels came near to earth and sang over Bethlehem's skies. You remember the song that they sang, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men. Or it begins to burst more clearly into view with the opening words of Luke 4. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. Get ready, Satan, the Scripture seems to say. Up till now you have had your way with most men and women, but you've never fought a man like this. The God-man. He will not give in. He will not give up. He will not back down. He will not sell out. Go ahead. Give it your best shot, but you're no match for him. He tried. He gave it his best shot at that time. And... Verse 13 says, And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. It had been pretty easy with Adam and Eve, and with everybody else in the meantime, but he couldn't do it with this man, because he was the God-man. But regardless of when it had begun, this seed growth process, or when it had ended, or how it had progressed. I, I, I just about blew my punchline. Regardless of how it had begun, or how it had progressed, it seemed that on the Sabbath day, that Sabbath day between Good Friday, and Easter Sunday, it was all over. Did you catch what I said? I said, it seemed like 
it was all over. Now, I, sometimes I don't even know what I'm thinking. For me to try to figure out what somebody else is thinking is nonsense. Especially for me to try to figure out what Satan was thinking, I don't want to know what he's thinking. I don't want anything to do with him. But could he have been thinking? And, and you theologians that are here in the congregation this morning, you, you, you will advise me, I'm sure. Did Satan think he'd won? Jesus was in the tomb. The, this was the, 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 the gospel process, the growth process had come to an end. And when the growth process comes to an end, what is the next thing? It's death. And Jesus was dead. His special friends had deserted them, every one of them. His body was lacerated and torn, and he lay motionless in a borrowed grave with no question that life had completely drained out of him every ounce of it. He was dead, completely dead. He looked like an animal that a ravenous lion had bitten by the neck and shaken hard over and over until the victim's torn, lifeless form hum, hung limply from the beast's vice-like jaws. Terrible wounds covered Christ from head to toe. Long, deep lacerations crisscrossed his skin. Countless, swollen, oozing welts and bruises blanketed his frame. And two, from a human standpoint, the resurrection seemed impossible because the resurrector had died. It was one thing for Jesus to resurrect others, even when they, like Lazarus, had been dead for four days. But what happens to faith when the life giver himself is dead? What happens when the miracle worker himself has been beaten and pounded into a crippled heap of skin? and bones. No one had ever brought himself out of the grave before. Oh yes, people had been resurrected, but no one had resurrected themselves. It would be like a cardiac surgeon trying to do his own transplant. Ridiculous. Jesus was dead. But Jesus wasn't the only one who died that day. The author of the book Desire of Ages says, With the death of Christ, the hopes of his disciples perished. They had spent the days and nights of the last few years in eager anticipation of what it would be like in the kingdom. Little realizing that they were in the kingdom here with Jesus, but they were wanting to be in the kingdom. What would their homes be like, they wondered. What would their positions be like? Who would be the greatest? But now, on this Passover Sabbath, all hope of the kingdom had faded. Like my dried up orchid and my rose bush that was blasted by the last winter ice storm, it looked like the battle had been too much for the promised kingdom. After all, you can't have a kingdom without a king. And the king lay dead in a borrowed tomb behind a Roman seal with no one, it seemed, to wake him up. He 
Yes, I think Satan must have watched with cautious concern throughout the long hours of Friday evening and the quiet hours of the Sabbath. I think Satan had overplayed his hand. It doesn't seem logical that it was his intention to kill Jesus. Just to torture him to the point of yielding to sin. But it hadn't worked. He hadn't sinned. And his last words on the cross could be understood two ways. You know, they, uh, the theologians again. Sorry I'm referring to them so much today. But the theologians again refer to those seven last words of Christ from the cross. Do you know what his last words were? It is finished. And if you just read those words, if you hadn't been there to hear him speak them, you, you, could, you, could, you could interpret them two ways. You could draw two things from it. Have you, have you thought about this? What did it mean? Was it a sigh of relief? Oh, it's finally over. Was it a sigh of relief or was it a shout of victory? Was it a, I can't fight anymore? Or praise God, I've conquered the forces of evil. And as long as Jesus lay enshrouded behind that giant stone with a Roman seal, Satan and his host still had hope. But their only hope was to keep him in that cave. But what must have worried him was it didn't, hadn't sounded like a, I can't fight anymore, but more like a victory cheer. Three of the gospel writers say that he said it is finished with a loud voice. And on the cross, when every breath was difficult for him to grasp, he shouted. It takes, it takes uh, air. It takes oxygen. It takes breath to shout. And he shouted, It is finished. When he said, it is finished, Satan, once again, was defeated. As it was with the story of Job, Satan was defeated. As it was in that story of Zechariah 3, and I'll let you look that up for yourself, Satan was defeated. As it was in the wilderness of temptation that we've just referred to, Satan lost again. We still fight, but it's a different battle. The apostle tells us we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities in high places, but we fight in a different way. We fight the good fight of faith. Faith in what he accomplished. But it is finished. The battle is over. You say, well, it's not over in my life, preacher. You should see some of the things that are going on in my life. But we don't fight that battle. We fight the fight of faith that says on this Easter Sabbath, if that's a theologically correct term, uh, this Easter Sabbath, it was finished because on Friday afternoon, just before he closed his eyes, the King of Kings said, it is finished. And so I don't have to fight the devil anymore. I have to fight the fight of faith that says to me, when the temptation comes, I'm not going there. Jesus won that victory on Friday afternoon 
over 2,000 years ago. And although on that Sabbath day, it looked like the seed was a shriveled up bag of mutilated flesh. Have you ever seen a seed that's been laying around for a long time? I imagine those seeds that they pulled out of the Egyptian tomb didn't look very pretty, shriveled up, dried up, but there was still life in the seed. The seed did not die. But praise God, it bloomed into everlasting life. He is not here, for He is risen. <laughs> 